Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When we look at the world around us, it seems like people are getting further and further from the Lord. If things about the Lord are true, why is that? Well, today we're studying Ezekiel 39, and we're going to see that indeed there is coming a day when the nations will totally turn away from the Lord and even fight against Him. Well, again, going back to our study today, today we are continuing in our study of one of the most difficult passages in the book of Ezekiel. Started yesterday in Ezekiel 38, today we go to Ezekiel 39, and although these chapters touch upon many other passages about the end times, or what's called eschatology, we're just going to be focusing on these chapters specifically so that we can just understand what they're saying so that we can lay down a foundation of the end times and just build upon that foundation as we continue going through God's word. And so yesterday we looked at Ezekiel 38. We began to unpack that chapter under two main headings or two main questions. First, who is being spoken about in Ezekiel 38 and 39? And when will these events happen or when will they take place? I propose that by and large, I think that the nations that God is addressing under the terms of Gog and Magog and Meshach and all of these other terms here, I think it's likely just referring to an array of just the non-Semitic countries or nations that will one day attack Israel. And, and it's even possible that they are just granular names that comprise the overall final Babylon that's spoken about in the book of Revelation. As for the timing, we mentioned that it is clear that these events have yet to happen. It is though less clear when they're going to happen. In my opinion, the best understanding is that these will be happening at the end of the tribulation or the end of the millennium. Now, a lot of my reasoning is actually tied to Ezekiel 39, which we're going to discuss today. Ezekiel 39 gives several events that I think just kind of set this event up as happening at the end of the tribulation and then leading to the millennial kingdom. And then that the Gog and Magog that you read about in Revelation 20, well, those are just another reprisal of evil at the end of time. So, with all of that being said, let's look at Ezekiel 39 and unpack what this chapter tells us about what's still to come. As we go in Ezekiel 39, once again, this chapter opens by addressing Gog and Magog and all that. Now, if you're using the NAS or the New King James Bible, then your translations describe Gog as being the prince of Rosh. But otherwise, most translations translate that word Rosh. You don't even see it in your translation because it's the word that's translated as chief. And that's generally how the word is translated in really the hundreds of other times it occurs in the Old Testament. It's really just this word for head or chief. And so in verses 1 and 2, it just continues the theme that we began back in chapter 38, that these events are about to transpire under the sovereign control of God, and God will bring the nations to this battle in Israel, and this will be the nation's final rebellion against the Lord, and this will be also their final defeat. And so going on to verse 3, it says that God will disarm them by taking their weapons out of their hand. In verse 4, they'll fall in the mountains. And in verse 5, they'll fall in the fields. In verse 6, the Lord will send fire down upon them. And all of this will happen in such a way that the world will know that God is and that he is the protector of his people. And this is a key point that we touched upon yesterday. See, for the past several months or so, we've been reading about how the prophets have been warning the people of God that they'll be judged by God and be overthrown by the surrounding nations. But now, here we're seeing in the book of Ezekiel, because remember, Ezekiel is writing from the exile, this judgment of God has already occurred. And now we're seeing that once God brings his people back to the land and once he restores them to himself, then when the nations come to attack him again in the future, God will protect them because they are his people, his special people. And so verse 7 goes on to say, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned any more. and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And so this is all just to show the people who he is and the nations who he is. And then to underscore the certainty of this event, verse 8 says, Behold, it is coming and it shall be done, declares the Lord. This is the day which I have spoken. And so here you're just seeing the certainty God has spoken. And therefore, we know that these words will come to pass. We can bank on them. And so that's the opening eight verses here in chapter 39. The next section of this chapter then tells us the kind of peace that this judgment upon the nations will produce for the people of Israel. Going on to verse 9, it says, Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires of them. 
And then in verse 10, they will have so much fuel from these weapons that they won't need firewood from the forest for seven years. Going on to verses 11 to 15, the nation's armies are going to just be buried in this land of Israel. It's going to take seven months for them to bury them all. And they'll even need to form a, a kind of team of people to make sure that all of the bones are buried. And the reason they're bones, well, that's alluded to back in verse 4 and also expanded upon in verses 17 to 20, because the birds of the air and the animals will come and, and feast on the bodies. Uh, not a great picture there, but nonetheless showing God's judgment upon the nations. And then in verse 21, the nations will see that this is judgment from God. And in verse 22, the house of Israel will know that the Lord truly is who he says he is. Now let's pause for a moment and let's maybe ask this question. What do we think about this? I can imagine there are some people who might hear about this judgment and say, you know, that just sounds extreme. I mean, just total decimation of the people. Really? But verse 24 lets us know this judgment upon them is completely just. The Lord says in verse 24, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them and I hid my face from them. And so here we're seeing that although this judgment is extreme, God has dealt with these people completely according to their rebellion against him. And if we have any concern, he might do this to us in any way. Well, our response just must be to come to him and repent and seek his grace and his mercy. He is a God of grace. He is a God of forgiveness. And if we don't align ourselves with these rebellious nations, and if we come to him and say, Lord, I need your forgiveness, he will grant us that forgiveness and he'll welcome us as his own. Well, going on, the final battle here will usher in a period of peace. And so in verse 25, it says, The Lord will restore the fortunes of Jacob. In verse 26, uh, they will forget their own disgrace. Not in the sense that they are indifferent to their own sins, but rather the joy of their present blessings will outweigh the pain of their suffering. And in verse 29, they will have complete fellowship with the Lord, and he will pour out his spirit upon them. So that's Ezekiel 39, and it's just kind of a quick overview here. Again, we're just establishing this foundation that we'll be building upon as we continue going through the Word of God. Now, how do we apply these to our lives? What's our takeaway? Well, here's a couple points I think we can make from this passage. First, the events of these two chapters are really against a backdrop of indifference to the Lord and His Word. The fact that the enemies of God can so completely disregard God's purposes for Israel, especially in the face of these prophecies that you have here, I mean, how can this even happen? God has been so clear. How could these nations war against Israel this way? Well, it just shows us that there must be a gradual drifting away from the clear message of the Word of God. And so people will one day be looking at these passages and discount them and discredit them and ignore them. Now, why is this? Well, I'm sure that in many ways the world just continued drifting further and further from the Lord. We're seeing that already in a world around us. But also, there are people today who are saying that we shouldn't look at these passages as actually prophetically speaking of things which will literally actually come to pass. There are many people who say this is just kind of a symbol of the, the battle, the ongoing battle of good and evil, of God and man, and, and this is just a symbolic passage. Well, when you read these passages, especially as we've been going through the Word of God and seeing all of these promises to the people of Israel, all of these future promises that have yet to come, we know that God still has a purpose and a plan for Israel. Yeah, okay, sure. The, the, the weapons in this passage here, yeah, we're talking about bows and, and clubs and horses and things like that. But these are weapons of warfare. And while it's possible that God will send some kind of event in the world that will just kind of send us all back to the Stone Age, more than likely, he's just simply using terms that his original readers would hear and understand. They would know those as weapons of warfare. And so even if this battle isn't one day waged on horseback, we can still see that God is speaking of a coming day when the world will make really probably a pragmatic decision to descend upon Israel to really poach from her her natural resources, and they will wage war against the people of Israel and ultimately the Lord. And so we just need to remind ourselves that we would never want to be the people who are standing against Israel and joining in the attack on the Jewish people. Going on here, having said all of this, there are many theologians who would say that the reason the nations could even just fight against Israel like this is because no one is standing up to defend her. And they would say that that's because at this point in history, in the future, the church has been raptured because the church is primarily the one around this world that stands for Israel and defends her. And so can we read between the lines here and see the rapture of the church? Well, maybe. I, it's possible. And if so, 
There are two theological camps that really would speak of that kind of a rapture. One is called, it's kind of a long-term dispensational premillennial pre-tribulationism or just pre-tribbers. The other is called pre-wrath or mid-tribulationism. A, a lot of good people are in both camps and just really go into the Word of God and, and they'll go to these kind of passages and say the fact that the church doesn't defend Israel is because the church has been raptured. Now that's possible. But it's also possible that the church is just falling away. Like I mentioned, there are Christians this day who would say that the church has replaced Israel, so we don't need to defend her anymore. And, and if the church is not raptured, it's not impossible to think that the church is just drifting further and further away from true, accurate, biblical truth. Jesus says in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And when you read just Paul's prophecies and just the general gist of prophecy in Scripture, the basic message is, as the days of mankind unfold, we're just going to drift further and further from the Lord. And so maybe that's why the church doesn't stand up for Israel in the final days. Well, going on, the overall point of these two chapters is the, really the last verses of chapter 39, when God establishes peace on this earth and just pours out his spirit upon his people. And so as it's commonly said, we know the end of the book. No matter what kind of difficulties we face, no matter what kind of tribulation we go through, uh, no matter what uncertainty we see in this world, we know that in the end days, the Lord is victorious. In fact, if you look over the last two chapters, you notice that even Israel doesn't have to do anything. They don't have to amass their own army. They don't have to lob nukes at the enemy. It's the Lord who acts on their behalf. It's the Lord who completely destroys the enemy completely without them. Their only role is once the battle is done, to bury the dead and seek to cleanse the land. And so in the end, God's people can trust him. He will be victorious. He will establish his people. He will glorify his name. He'll pour his spirit out upon them. Well, we'll end things there. So much good reading here in Ezekiel. Thanks for being a part of it. And with that, I'll see you tomorrow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.